keepers do. Oh, okay. You could expect a few more. pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome, and those of you who are with us this evening. And I uh, hope that you will uh, enjoy the, the presentations this evening. Um, any additions or deletions to the agenda? We do have a revised agenda at, uh, for people. We have a nomination for kitchen manager at Maple Street School tonight. And because it's so connected to revenues and where we are, where we are at, uh, Michelle completed the November financial, so we'll discuss that as well. Thank you. Any correspondence? And so I did create a, a correspondence folder in um, the meeting folder. So I put the letter from Mr. Congoran that was sent around regarding um, funding, uh, the budget committee schedule, and an email just uh, just grabbed uh, today or yesterday about reading. So those were all correspondence to the board. Great. Thank you very much. Um, in the packet was three sets of minutes. Um, I'll uh, take a motion for the Hopkins School Board to approve the minutes of the non-public session of the school board meeting held on November 21st. Move. Seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Take a motion for the Hopkins School Board to approve the minutes of the regular board meeting held on December 5th, 2019. So moved. So moved. Seconded. Thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Take a motion for the Hopkins School Board to approve the minutes of the non public session of the regular board meeting held on December 5th, 2019. So moved. Seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed motion carries. At this point, we have the first opportunity for public comment tonight. So we have two opportunities throughout the meeting, uh, through each of our board meetings, for uh, the community to step forward to the microphone and tell us their name and then provide any input or comment that they would like to um, to the school board on anything that may be on our agenda this evening or anything that might be on your mind. Uh, is there anybody who would like to provide comment at this point. There'll be another opportunity toward the end of the meeting as well. You all from Civics, welcome. Welcome, glad you're welcome. here. Welcome. All right, we'll wait until, the, wait until that second opportunity. Um, comments for the Hopkins School Board, I'll start down there with you. Um, I actually don't have anything to say, but I'm excited to be back talking about uh, the budget. Great, Jarrah? I also don't really have much to say for once, so yeah. <laughs> That's okay. No. Um, yeah, just a couple things. So. The Christmas concert was fantastic this week. I have to say thank you very much. I realize I'm down to two more left about. Um, kids did great. Your kids did great too, by the way. They sung great and uh, it was well organized and uh, had a lot of fun with it. Um, I, I went to the select board meeting this week. Um, it was great to listen to our taxpayers. Uh, Jim, thank you for sending the, uh, the letter to the board. Um, it was interesting to hear them about um, the new tax assessment and where they are with um, the increase. And it's just important for us, but while we do this budget, to be uh, understanding of their their feelings and uh, do what's best for the school, but also for the taxpayers. Um, I thought it was great to listen to John Tobin. I, I heard him once before uh, at Rotary, but uh, it, it is, you know, as we sit here and, and you know, I don't want to say fight, but try to come up with a solution from, from each side. I mean, it's important to understand the inefficiencies of the state in terms of how it's trying to fund public education. And uh, I, I wish him well with his pursuit of uh, trying to create some, some more fairness across the state. But it is great to see him, and uh, thanks for bringing him in, Steve. Um, I just I first want to thank you know, Steve and Michelle and everybody else for the work on the budget documents. Um, it's not easy. It's a lot of work, so thank you. And thanks uh, for being able to get it out a little bit earlier today so we had a chance to peek at it. That was really helpful to me. Uh, and then I, I just want to apologize to everyone. I have to leave at around 6.30, um, and so my sincere apologies. Um, it's nothing you said. It would be me. <laughs> Great. Thank you all for your um, comments this evening. We're going to move right into presentation and staff reports, and I'm going to turn the meeting over to um, Mr. Chamberlain for the fiscal year 21 budget development continue. You guys are coming around are some uh, slides, and Amy, if you can make sure the community gets that as well. Thank you, Patrick. Well, thank you. This is the second of either three or four. 
Meetings devoted to the budget, state. just to like see where we were last week. We talked about the operational budget. That's the giant spreadsheet of what we do, how we, uh, what we focus on, our work, our mission, all that. Today, we're going to talk about revenues and long-term financial position, trusts, and take a first peek at a tax rate to see where we are at this point. So the goals from today, um, and there's, there's some revised costs since last week. We're going to talk about that. We also have a slide. Matt provided some costs regarding technology, so we're going to uh, revisit that slide. As I said, we're going to do the long-term financial picture. We're going to do estimated revenues, a little tax impact. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about class size, a little bit of research, a little bit about where we are in the region and what we believe. And then hopefully at the end, a charge from the board. And if the board would like to see a programmatic budget maybe next week or the week after, just give us a heads up on that. Does that sound all right? Um, so since last week, um, so we continually update the budget. Our mantra is we budget for what we know. Up until last week, we had some open positions and some people with some, uh, some uh, health insurance changes. We have filled some positions and solidified some health insurance. So since last week, we reduced the budget by a little over 39000 And so that is related to health insurance for people we've hired as opposed to estimates, and we now know actualities. So the current budget is now up you know, about 1.1, and that's 6%. Uh, we still have some open questions. One of the open questions that I'm working on is a significant increase in elementary math, working with a vendor trying to figure that out, um, and maybe a couple of other open questions. One of, but what we've always done is, we, it, as changes go, we, we make those changes. Once, uh, Michelle and Liz might remember, uh, we changed our electricity rate the day of the budget committee. And Jan might remember that too. We went in and saved like forty or fifty thousand dollars because of our electricity bid. So we will continually update this as we go. Um, and we, we like it when it goes down. So um, that's where we are since our last meeting. That spreadsheet's around and that'll be up. There's not a significant a lot of things changed just in that area. Um, thanks to Matt. Um, so this was a slide that just we want to talk about flesh out some costs. So at Herald, uh, the 70 devices are about $250 each. That's $17,500. Replace projectors were about a dozen in district, and those are $1,800 a piece. The lab at um, Maple is $21,600. The library computers is $10,800. When we're talking about carts, we're talking about the Chromebook carts were $6,500 each. Um, so there we had one at Maple, a couple at Middle. Um, and 6,500. So those are our numbers: 250 device, 6,500 for a card, 1,800 for a projector. Um, thanks, Matt. I appreciate that. that was a follow-up for questions about costs on that slide last week. Everybody okay? That was a bid process, correct? Uh, those are we typically do a bid. He does an estimate, but yes, we put this out to bid. It's actually that's a fun thing. Okay. Because hopefully it comes in lower. But yes, that, that's based on the estimate. But we do bid this stuff up. Okay. Thanks. So, um, and after I, I go through this, I, I'm happy to put the CIP up, that document up, and we can actually see it, but, so our, our capital improvement uh, plan, so these, those, that first part of the text, that comes from the CIP committee in this town, that's our threshold, about $10,000, non-recurring, five years, and bonds. Now, this is a planning tool, this isn't a funding tool, so... But what drove our maintenance trust and, and the technique used, last year we had a lot of discussion. Do we put CIP in the budget or do we still use the mechanism of the maintenance trust to fund? And we have settled in using the maintenance trust. So in our CIP, if you went on, you would see paving. And I'll, I'll show you all the costs, they're all there. Uh, classroom furnishes, an oven, and uh, a tentative replacement of the office air conditioning. Why well, that's tentative because we are, through the facility project, if we have a significant move of the office, we assume they move the air conditioning with it, and that probably would be folded into the facility project. At Maple, and remember this paving we tried to do last year, we didn't get any reasonable bids on it, so we're gonna jump onto the town and use that collaboration. So at Maple, we've got some paving, class of furnishers, again, AC is a question. So what's happening with air conditioning is the, the refrigerant is actually changing. It's a new, it's a new um, refrigerant, and as long as it doesn't leak, as long as it stays tight, we are fine. But if it leaks, you, it's a whole massive replacement. You can't just fill it. This, this type of current refrigerant is not available. 
so it requires a significant change. But we are, so it is something Michelle and I will talk about putting on, on watch. We're watching that very closely. Um, so the high school, uh, middle high school, more paving. We have a bleacher repair, and I'll, throw, I'll go through all these costs at the end. Uh, classroom furnishers, a hot water heater, a steamer in the kitchen, again, AC, what I just, and the walk-in needs new refrigeration. Um, the SAU office, now remember, we changed the name of this and the ability to use this for the SAU building. And so we changed it from schools to district-wide. And one of the things um, that um, I want, I'm going to talk with, with Gordon and, and Phil Hickey, our reps on the, on the facilities, is how much would it cost for them to do an assessment of the SAU, whether or not we can expand. So this is a placeholder. We only want to put money into the SAU office, of course, if it can in the long term meet our needs, but it's a placeholder. The first thing we would do, Michelle and I spoke, it really is savings in uh, energy and also a worker's climate. There's some breezeways and some, there's some drafts that we think the first thing to hit at the SAU office would be windows. Um, roofs are coming soon, but we don't have a current leak, so we think windows we do have, if you will, uh, drafts. Met with Matt, um, based on some donations and some work he's been able to do on this budget, we think we can defer the storage and the servers for another year. So that came from our CA and CIP. That's our next year planning. So how does this roll in? So now we're going to talk about a contribution into the maintenance trust because that's how we fund it. And so last year we funded the maintenance trust with $140,000. 40 um, came from fund balance, and 100,000 was raised and appropriate at the meeting. And that's the first time that we actually took non unreserved fund balance funds and added to it. Um, we did a lot of work. So currently, today, if you, and I'll show you this at the end of this, 192,000 is there. And everything I just talked about in the previous two slides, all those four areas, the window, the refrigerant, is $259,000. What it doesn't do, it doesn't take on the air conditioning. Because right now, it is functioning as, as planned. So that's the, those three air conditionings are something that we're going to put on standby. If we did $259,000 worth of work and, and we fund it at, uh, we're talking about funding it at the same level this year, $140,000, and I'll take a look at that when we go through all the revenue, we'd have $72,000 in reserve after that work. So what we're talking about for the repair of maintenance, is $140,000 in same level, so no increase. It's a level funded as this year, doing $259,000 worth of work. Worried a little bit about the next priority is air conditioning at the three schools, and then that would leave us 725. So that's where we are in our capital investment. Um, let's talk about the special education trust. So this was established in 2005. Uh, we changed the name in 2018. So last year we took that, last summer, if you remember, we took out $40,000 to pay for unanticipated special education costs. We have currently $129,000 in the trust. What we, for my, really most of my career here, certainly as superintendent, we've settled in about $170,000 in reserve. So the recommendation is to put $40,000 into the special ed trust. Uh, as, as Becky would sleep better if we added $140,000, but it served us pretty well over the last 10, 12 years that I've been in this seat. So for the special ed trust, we're projecting and estimating as we start looking at the whole warrant, $40,000. That would get us up to our standard level that we've had for a long time. Vehicle replacement. Um, so currently we have $45,000 in this account ready for the fully accessible bus or the, the small uh, transportation bus. Um, Becky, Michelle, and I have had uh, uh, meetings and done some research. The reason why this year we're unsure is we've had some circumstances that have increased our transportation area in our student services in that we might save significant money if we expanded our fleet and did some of this transportation in-house. So there's, a, there's, as I talked about last meeting, we are extraordinarily regulated. So, so from school to home, you have to have a vehicle marked school bus. Um, and then obviously if we're, if we're transporting special education students, there's a higher threshold of regulation. And if we're doing during the school transportation to an internship or doing to a service, there's a different type of transportation there. So um, that's what we're, we're looking at. Actually, you know, Michelle recently got written approval from the state because we have to make sure we follow this regulation very tight. 
Um, so we might have a more rec a recommendation on that in the next month or so. But planned is replacing the small bus, fifty thousand um, dollars, and the van coming up in, in twenty two would be twenty three thousand would be the new van. And we are planned contribution on our schedule of fifteen thousand dollars. That's our vehicle replacement. Are you okay? Tax rate stabilization. So this was established in March of 2012. It happened to be Article 10 in that meeting. Sometimes Michelle and I talk about his Article 10 funds. This was it's put savings to reduce peaks and uh, peaks in uh, tax rate to stabilize the tax rate. Last year we used 175,000. Currently there's 156,000, and certainly it's the of the board. But right now the worksheet you're going to see and go through in a few minutes has a zero taken out of it. Um, just because we're at 156 and, and, and we want to talk about revenue. Um, but that's where we are right now. So just looking ahead, this is what the warrant will look like. Um, or something like, obviously the order and, a, and, the, and the strategy that the board wants to deploy is certainly open. So um, last year, by statute, our Article 1 was the bond. Every year before that, Article 10, reports and agents, has always been one but we can slide that wherever you want. For today's purposes, the first one is the budget. Second one, and so we're talking, a contingency fund right now is only there to talk about those math classes we talked about last week. The expanding program, we're not sure if the personal finance in the math topics will supplant, replace other math classes it could, or it could take another 50 kids who weren't in math and we may need all of it. So that's the only recommendation right now coming in the contingency fund is related to math. A couple of things you may want to think about, and, and it keeps Bill Carroza sleeping at night, or is not sleeping at night, is this 86 kindergarten thing. If kindergarten pops to five and there's zero backfill, um, it would be to, to go, if we had four and 86, 22, 20, 22, 23, 23, 22 would be just difficult. So right now there is no plans to be in contingency situation for the projected kindergarten. So we have currently, there's a negotiating team negotiating for the, teams, uh, for the teachers and teamsters. So the reason why it's three and four, three would be the article about the warrant, four is in, if the warrant fails, you can have a special meeting. So those two are always in tandem. Budget, contingency, teacher's contract, teamsters contract, Maintenance trust, we're talking about 142.5, pretty close to what it was last year. Vehicle already talked about that, 15. And special ed trust, about 40. So that, those top, if, now, for articles, the Teamsters and the teachers, what has to happen over here on the warrant is both the associations have to ratify and the full board has to ratify. And that has not happened yet. Our timeline, um, is we know we're, we're very focused on January 8th budget committee, right? January 15th budget committee, uh, January 22nd. The, it has to go to the association and the full board and then be ready to go to the budget committee. So we really are looking at no later than January 15th. And both teams are aware of that schedule. Everybody okay? So that's a tentative warrant. Everybody all right? Doing okay. Let's talk a little bit about revenues. So coming around is a worksheet. And take a whole bunch of those and pass them around. So this is our so this is where we are today. This is not complete because the warrant is incomplete. So I'm gonna give you a minute so everybody can get a copy of the revenue sheet. This is the one I have blown up. What's that? Uh, uh, 17, we're wearing it out of 20? No, no 17, 17 to 20, we're not wearing it. Really? Wow. That's a lot. I'm going to work on that. What's Everybody got it? Everybody okay? So, so the tax rate is a combination of how much you spend and how much you take in revenue. The first topic is revenue from local sources. Um, as you can see, there's, there's slight changes, a little bit more in the food service up 15, and a little bit more in the student activities. So that's, the local sources is pretty flat. 
Um, the net, everybody okay, everybody with me? Following along? Pretty all right? Yeah. The state sources. If you look, building aid, right, we paid off the bond and the building aid, so that ended years ago. The first number is, the first one we're going to talk a little bit about is special education aid. A couple years ago, this was known as CAD aid, catastrophic aid. That name has been changed to special education aid. So if you look in, when we set the tax rate in October, November, the number was $379,000 that we received from the state. That was 91% of the need in the state. And that was an increase in the, um, the, the latest, that, the budget that passed. The proration. Yeah. The pro, so it was 91%. And we used 100, we used all of that, and that was 379. This year, we did the calculation, and so in all our experience, Becky's experience, Michelle's and mine, that 91% was, is a very, it's a good number, but it's a number that we can't depend on. Um, we've always benefited, and we've tried with conservative estimating. So the number that is there, 206,000, is about 68 to 70%, which is much more typical in this category. So if we were very aggressive, and budgeted 110% of special education aid, that would be one, but, but we've been very conservative. I go back to my very first year as superintendent when another superintendent in a southern district uh, did not budget the GMR, actually went 10% below the GMR and ended up being very financial situation. So we always, so we, I think it's benefited us to be conservative. So that's where that 172 came from, down. Then we have a little bit of uh, child nutrition down a little bit. And then let's take a look at state adequacy education grant. So this is up $641,450. This is what Jim alluded to right the one time. This is the increase. It is not a formula increase. This is an additional that they put in the budget. But that is up $641,000. Uh, and the next piece, the state property tax went down 38000 So those are the changes through the revenue from the state sources and how we've accounted for them. Everybody okay? Let's take a look at uh, federal sources. Uh, this is other federal sources. Child nutrition is down 5000 The next, The last one in that category, if you remember when we set the tax rate, we had typically received through Medicaid reimbursement about 180,000, 200,000, and the state, and Becky's gonna to speak to this in a minute, but we adjusted when we set the tax rate, and we took that, if you will, bitter pill, and budgeted it as 2,000, which we had already received. So we have already adjusted our revenue for the change in rules. And Becky, can you just talk about where we are statewide and in, in, sure. in the Medicaid reimbursement? Yeah, so I don't think we need to go backwards because I, you know, this is for the upcoming year. So there's been multiple stakeholder meetings to try to give input on the new Medicaid rules. Those are completed at this point. Um, DHHS brought their version of the rules that they're going to file to the Medicaid board, the medical licensing board on Monday. Um, and those rules are going to go forward at this point. There will be some opportunity for public comment and things like that in January with a finalization in February. But none of the changes that were incorporated in the filed rules change any of the ordering requirements or the provider requirements that have sort of put us into this situation. So there is still some discussion about legislation that might come forward or other um, opportunities to adjust the rules. But at this point, if we were to bill or be able to bill for anything, which we really can't bill for anything right now. None of our providers or our ordering sources meet the spirit of the new law. Um, that would take a lot of other kind of conversations about how we might want to look at that. So I think this $2,000 that's in there is a very minimal amount of what potentially, um, that's what we received this year from when we started billing on July 1st to August 27th. Uh, which was when the new rules went into effect, the emergency rules. So that's what this is based off of. Um, there will be a lot more conversation, I'm sure, at the state level about how to move things in a different direction. Um, but as, as is often the case, I think New Hampshire um, wants to write its own Medicaid state plan the way that it would like to write it, and it's not mirrored on any other state plans. So it's taking a bit longer for us to sort of work through those pieces. We are not at risk. 
We are not budgeting, no. expecting something that we're not getting. We are, right. any Medicaid reimbursement that we get will be an addition. It's not, you know, we are not putting the district at risk on counting on it. it. But if it comes and the rules change and we can access it, access it, we will. But this is not putting us at risk. We budget what we know, um, and this is where we are. Everybody okay? Mm -hmm. Now, if we do get $200,000 from Medicaid, we like that. We'll talk about that when it happens. Um, other financing sources, you can see that we are not, we won't receive proceeds because there is no bond. That's that piece. The, the Title IIA transfer is a little bit. Um, the expendable trust funds. So what Michelle and I would like the board to consider is not using uh, fund balance for our trust funds, raising and appropriating, and using the fund balance to work on our facilities and, you, and work on our tax rate stabilization. So we, will, uh, we are looking at, we, and the next piece is the big one. It's the un, less fund balance to reduce taxes. It was 464 three, last three, one, four. year. It's got 414. We are projecting based on the so November table. financial that we'll talk about later in the agenda, the right $150,000 yeah. for fund balance from 464, that's down 314,000. So that, and we've talked about this the last two years, about the need to reset the fund balance yeah, but those are the because it was creeping up different. and creeping up and creeping up. It actually controls and constricts implementing of a budget if we are simply saving money right, but up there um, four, out of the budget. Four, right. So, and then the last one there is that the, today there's a recommendation not to take money out of the tax rate stabilization, so that would be a loss of revenue by 175,000. So all that, so that's the revenue through, and we take it to the bottom. Now, just remember, this is not a complete picture because all the warrants are not here, the, the teachers' contract and things like that. But as of what we have here, it would be a dollar 45 increase in the tax rate. That's based on the revenue, that's based on Medicaid, that's based on resetting the unreserved fund balance, uh, all that. It's $1.45 on the tax rate. This will continue to, and obviously the board has a significant number of choices. Do you want to take money from ta uh, the un unreserved fund balance, I'm mean, sorry, from the tax rate stabilization? The hope is, ev almost every day now, I get an email saying, when can we implement the FY20 budget? Um, and we are in advance right now. The, the November financial, having $150,000 left in fund balance, has implementing the FY20 budget. No money out of the trust, the special education trust, um, and uh, but all, all of this comes together for $1.45. Question? We'll do that. Everybody okay? Any questions for Steve at this time? At this point, yeah, I think we've got a couple Save of more things to do. Okay. Yeah. Just, Becky, on, just so yeah. I understand, on the Medicaid reimbursement. Sure. So, help me. So, the, the two pieces of providers and ordering. And so, I just right. I'm just curious so, on our system how that. Well, our, our system was the same system that all districts yeah. were following at the time, which was that school district uh, providers, so speech, OT, school psychologist, um, some behavior services. Those people were considered licensed practitioners of the healing arts, and under the old Medicaid rules, they were allowed to order medically based services in the school setting, right? So, when the, and then those people would carry out the services and they were considered Medicaid providers, and they could bill for a portion of those services because they were providing medically based services in the school setting. When they rewrote the emergency rules, um, they changed the ordering requirements. So now the only people that can order services, regardless of where they happen, but specific to us in the school setting, are a medical doctor, a physician's assistant, or an APRN. None of which, the majority, if any school districts in New Hampshire employ any three of those kinds of people. So the ordering becomes an issue from the start. And so you can't provide services without this order from some one of those three people. In addition to that, the only people that they would be considering 
uh, billable providers at this point are people who are li medically licensed under their board. So um, psychology, for example, in the past, school psychologists could bill for counseling services under the old Medicaid rules. Um, but now, school psychologists, people that are certified through the Department of Ed, the Department of Ed certification is not equitable to a medical license. Um, so they're, they no longer meet that statute for people to be able to even bill or be providers. And there's no one in the school setting, really, other than occasionally maybe a physical therapist um, who, under their board of licensure and their scope of practice, can, can bill for services. It would have to be part of their practice already. Um, so it's created a lot of discourse because not only um, are the people ordering the services responsible for saying this is how many services and what services the kids need, they're also committing, and the, the way the rules read, to supervising those services on site. So not only would we need to find doctors or PAs who are willing to order the services, but they're also committing on their license that they're supervising those services at some level, and our providers also have to be licensed to provide those services from a medical standpoint. Um, so that's why it's created such a um, trickle-down effect for people. Um, there's lots of ideas about how districts could go about setting that up. Unfortunately, none of them have been vetted through the Department of Health and Human Services. So um, you might hear a few districts out of all the districts in New Hampshire, I think there's three, who have sort of decided to try to take on their own process with the risk of at some point having to pay back funds that they may be trying to recoup at this point, but the majority of districts and special ed directors don't feel like that's the right way to do it. That's really helpful, thank you. You're welcome. Right, okay. thank, you. thank you. So um, it came up a little bit, and then Liz asked if I put a couple of things together on class size. 81%, um, as we talked about last week, 81% of the budget is uh, benefits so, <laughs> so whenever you talk, well, I'll give everybody. So what I put together is a little bit of research, a little bit of thoughts, a little bit of regional stuff, K two. Um, you threw and then a little bit of us and how it happens. Um, and then certainly we can do more. Um, so the resource or, or the scholarly argument, everybody refers to this Tennessee Star experiment, 84 to 88, something like that. Um, and they determined, they did a randomized and they did a, a, a control group and they found that smaller class size did have a short term and long term positive effects for student achievement. There's also articles about questioning the legitimacy of generalizing that situation, Tennessee, and that situation to, for example, Hopkins, New Hampshire, a little bit different. But that is the resource. Years ago, uh, I had made a proposal to reduce a class size uh, to, to find funds for a curriculum director, and it would have increased sixth grade at the time because that was a different pedagogical approach. And committee members brought the STAR report and said, Steve, this is what you're doing. It's, it's very common to bring the STAR report out. So what uh, has been a huge influence on the district and really a driving force in the magnificent instruction movement is John Hattie's work. So John Hattie is an Australian researcher who did a meta-analysis of meta-analysis. And so he looked at hundreds of thousands of studies with hundreds of thousands of participants. And what he looks at is high leverage practices. And what his theory is, and I buy this, is that we have a limited amount of time. We might as well use the pedagogical approaches that have the greatest return, high leverage. And he talks about one of the things, it's something that whenever you have a high leverage practice is actually putting a picture next to a, a definition. That activates, activates both sides of the brain. And when I work with new teachers and I work with uh, colleges, I always say, if you're ever doing vocab, Always have a picture next to it. It makes no sense not to because it is a high leverage strategy. You learn from my own kids, if they're learning vocab, I said find a picture, put it next to it, and it will imprint it that much quicker. So that's an example of a high leverage strategy. Um, so he does not list class size as a high leverage strategy. He 
So just because you have 15 kids in a class, or just because you have 25 kids in a class, doesn't automatically mean achievement goes up or goes down. What instruction is the it, 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 Magnificent instruction is a very strong high leverage practice to increase student achievement. That being said, one of the high leverage strategies, whoops, one of the highest leverage strategies that you do is feedback. We know, going back to Mike Tim, and Mike Tim, who was a teacher, probably not many people know nowadays, but when Mike Tim was here, he would say, Steve, the way you improve writing, and he was a huge piece for me, is you gotta give feedback. Feedback, drafts and feedback. And if you want to give me 25 kids in the class, Steve, then that's going to limit the amount of feedback that I give, which is a high leverage practice. So it's not, if you have someone with 25 kids in the class give the same amount of feedback as 15, you can, you can slay that dragon. But it is, mo, it is very difficult to go 25 essays the same amount of time as you give 15. So um, that's this notion about class size does impact it. But, Magnificent instruction trumps class size. That being said, I remember, I remember actually the budget committee, the community, everybody said, no, we don't want to squeeze the, the sixth grade team so we can get a curriculum director. I don't know if you remember that. It was actually in this room. I remember where I was sitting at the time. And so the community made it very clear that they are very much in favor of my class size. Um, so a little bit. So um, if you look, I went through so the departments at the secondary level. And there it is. So we have, we do not, as I said last week, there's not a policy in the Hopkins School District that says you, you have to do this. And there's, uh, there's another school district in the Lakes region that said the maximum class size in grades four through six is 24. If you have 25, they put it in two by policy. And I don't know if that was, but I remember when they did that, and I said, wow, and so there's no judgment. You have 25, you're in two, you have 24, you're in one. We, you know, we look at it case by case. So as you can see there, and I think I put it in there, we have a class of seven for account. And so how does that happen? And that's a, that's a very reasonable question. So we run classes, our minimum is 12. This class, before drop add and before the master schedule, had 11 requests. I talked to Mrs. Fisher today. After you ran the schedule, only seven people could fit it in. And so what, and the timing is very important because by law, we have to give teacher contracts by April 15th. Drop ad doesn't end until September 15th. So, but once we give a teacher a contract, they're gonna teach. <laughs> you know, so that the timing and the regulation is very important. So typically we don't get that, but with a one section of something like accounting, because there's only one and there's, right, there's one section of uh, uh, fourth level uh, language or one section uh, singletons, it's very difficult, and Rebecca does a great job, but that's what happened there. We had enough requests, and then the, when you did the master schedule, some people couldn't fit it in. So what some districts have done, and I actually was a recipient when I was a teacher, because they weren't ready to give contracts and, and years and years ago, it's called a contingency rip. And this district has done everything we can not, so you can just say, well, we're not sure we're going to contingency rip you. And I did receive a contingency riff when I was a teacher at Hollis for Klein. And then as soon as you have a contingency riff, you look. Right? Because you don't have a job. So in, in Hollis for Klein, they turned it over in 30 days. I was a varsity basketball coach, so I wasn't that interested in going. But, you know, you know, I was certainly worried about it. We have not contingency riffed. Chris has moved his uh, program of studies up. He's requests up. He's done everything he can to give us as much information as we can about April 15th. We've had a contingency fund to support it. Um, and um, so we think that is, it's done the best we can, but occasionally a class like this will slip. But as you see, our class sizes are pretty strong. Our elementary class sizes are there, our secondary classrooms are there. Um, we are not an outlier, as Michelle said, she looked up, she goes, we're not an outlier. We're within the noise of where class size is. Some are high, we're smaller and some, bigger and some, but that's where we are. Jim, you actually mentioned this about something with the budget committee. If you want more, I'm happy to flesh it out more, but this was the first salvo into just talking about that. I think this is great. I can share that with the committee, and then when we do the presentation, if they have more questions, like that. Absolutely. That sounds great. Um, you because it makes sense. 81% of this budget is, um, of course, personnel of how we work. Um, so really from here, and it's a very funky uh, budget development season, so a week from tonight is 
It's December 19th. That's our third one. We can bring stuff together. We won't be able to flesh out the teachers' contracts by next week. That I'm pretty sure of. So that's still a question until hopefully the first week in January. Um, if the board wants scenarios or, or wants something, um, that, that's what we're here to do tonight. The problem is Thursday the 19th to January 2nd is one school, well, two school days. The Friday the 20th and the January 2nd itself. So there's not a whole lot of time. But I remember Liz and I spent January 1 at Panera once talking about stuff. I don't know if you remember that. It was the best yeah. hot chocolate I've ever had in my life. Anymore. That's New Year's Day I had. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we certainly can go. Liz and I go to Panera anytime. So I do, before we go on and stuff, I just want to show you the CIP and so I can show you some costs that I didn't include, but they are available to the public. So you get to the uh, CIP online um, facilities, capital improvement. It's, uh, it's not gonna be, I'll try and blow it up as much as I can. So the CIP by building, if you look at Harold, the green ones are command plus, command shift. How's that? A little better? So the paving at Harold, we're talking about just about 20 grand. Um, classroom furnishings, about 3,000. Um, double electric, uh, the 11 is 10,000. Uh, this is the 36 is what we're keeping, right? We're not sure about that because of the facility project. I can go to the maintenance trust probably better. Um, so the maintenance, this is where we fund. So actually it's, um, you know, I might be able to adjust this number. I don't know if it's three or five, but the office uh, AC is 36,000. Classroom, uh, Maple Street is 4,000 for classroom furnishings. Bleacher repair, 38,000. Paving, 16,000. Furnishing at the high school, 9,000. A steamer is 10,000. And the new refrigeration for the walk-in is 55,000. And there's our roofs. Oh, we don't want roofs. We want windows. I gotta adjust a little bit more. So I'll make that adjustment, but that's where we are. Um, there's, I'm trying to move the CIP into this, but that's, and I'll adjust this tonight, but that's where we are on the cost. The big hit is refrigeration at the high school, 38,000 refrigeration. Questions for me, for Michelle, for leadership? We have another meeting in a week. Can I ask a couple questions just on the, ex the new expense sheet that we received? Sure. Just so I understand um, all the numbers. So I'm going to start towards the bottom of the transportation. Um, so there's an increase of the special transportation line. It's, it's like an $82,000 increase. So yeah. can you just help me understand what that line is for. That's what I was referring to. That is uh, students who go out of district require specialized transportation. Okay, so that's district students. Yep, that's the number we're looking at to see if we can bring some of that in-house. We might be able to save money. Okay. And then, um, Again, you might have gone over these. I just want to see how they line up in this. No, so I, great. I apologize. No, no. Um, so under the facilities is the operating building services, and that increased by like forty-one thousand dollars. Right. So that's in the um, operation and repair and maintenance. So that's a three-year average. Okay. Uh, and then the office of the of the principal service. Services, that's a $47,000 increase. Right, so what happens is when we budget this year for next year, the non union raises are in a different line item. They're actually in the superintendent budget. So they're not, so what happens is that individuals got raises, but the actual budget that was approved for 1920. Even though it gets adjusted later on, like we just did a budget adjustment it's recently, yeah. right? Okay. Um, but we use what was passed. We don't use what was adjusted. Okay. So um, because there's no teachers in there, so really it's the last year's 
non-union. Non-union, okay. or limited HES. There are some, you know, I think there's maybe one maybe that falls within that realm. Um, but for the most part, it's non-union. And it, and it has to do sometimes with uh, changes in um, benefits. Thank you. That helps. Uh, I think that's, I assume the only other one I was going to question, but I think I know the answer. It's the technology services, it's $48,000, but that's, that's what you just went over and that's. That and then the uh, same thing with salaries because um, most of those individuals are non-union. Oh, okay, so they're in this line? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. Yeah. Steve, can you talk a little bit about the grant that we're receiving and how you, I, I, I'm uh, trying to get the grant we're receiving from the state, the 641K? I'm trying to connect the dots in here. How is this allocated into your presentation? I'm just trying to understand a little it, bit. It comes in just as revenue. Okay. So as a board, we decide, we're going to decide how to use that. Well, you're going to make a recommendation to us? On so it's, uh, no, it's just to come in to offset the taxes. So we, we only spend the operational budget, and that came in. And there is no record, like for us, Michelle and I, we are not re recommending utilizing that fund for anything except come in as revenue. So there's not a new positions coming. Oh, we can take some of that. We're using it just as revenue. Which, in fact, helps with the recommendation of resetting the fund balance to $150,000. Okay. Instead of what we've been before, because the last three years, we, we can't, you know, the piper's going to get paid sometime because we can't keep freezing because of unthink, unknown things that happen, um, we're not buying some of our basic stuff. At some point, it's gonna catch up with us. So that's another reason of why recommending, of really looking at resetting the fund balance. And when you have something like this, next year, um, you know, you have to deal with the revenue then. Um, but. So the, yeah. the thought is, and Michelle and I spent a lot of time on this. So each year, when it gets up to four hundred sixty-four thousand dollars, and we have we have about a hundred thousand dollars for food service, and how do you find that out of the budget? And what we'd like to do is reset it to one hundred and fifty. Then, if we do, let's say there is an additional two hundred thousand dollars left, then have the board have a meeting and say we'd like to pay, we'd like to change the air conditioning at Harold Martin School, or we'd like to put two hundred thousand dollars away as long as we don't get to the cap. And I think I shared a bill that would raise the cap in the, te in the um, Article 10 tax rate stabilization. The, we're having a difficult time utilizing fund balance because it's got so high to, to get there. Because what in the old days, it's funny, I went back and we've been, in, the, in, in years ago, we used to have fund for retirements. And one of those retirements almost every year would go straight to fund balance. So we'd have to raise it and then give it right back. So the board, the town said, let's take a look at fund balance. So then we changed negotiations. Now we only have three. But that could have been $40,000 of fund balance every year. Course reimbursement. We have to do 25%. We do about 25 people for a five, five credit course at UNH. Now, for a couple of years, a lot of people already had, you know, we had that where our faculty, they had already achieved their master's degrees, and there was less utilization. That goes to fund balance. Now, we have, we have some younger staff, they're going to school, they're doing their thing, that's gone down. So that's put more pressure on fund balance. Um, so we would like to look at fund balance in a different way. And yeah, we, I mean, I, I agree with you to a degree, but I, you know, the budget committee and other, and other people in, in general have said they'd like to use some of that on something that maybe is not within the budget, like, you know, something that's, that's fixed that, you know, you know, something that needs to be fixed or something we normally can't afford to do. Um, it's just my feeling, you know, how we, we how we how we can use it better than uh, resources. Then, if you want, then you, if you wanted to, in, I mean, I don't know where you find it from, except well, funding. we got a grant from the state, correct? It's, it's a, that we unplanned revenue, correct? That they gave us a lot. No, we we know it, so we can't do it as unknown <coughs> unplanned revenue. We yeah. know we've we, we, been given the amount, so it's not like well, it's coming in. Yeah, it is anticipated. It's anticipated. So if you want to put an extra 200,000, so right now we're recommending a fund maintenance trust at 140. And you want to take $200,000 and put that more, right? You want to? 
I haven't said I, I want to do anything. I'm but if you did, right? if you did, now that's 340. Yeah. So where does that $200,000 come from? Say that one more time. Where are you going to get the 200? Say the question again, please. I'm doing the numbers in my head. Right. So if you wanted to put more money away to fix them or put a maintenance trust yep. instead of 140 that we're yep. recommending. If you can raise an appropriate 200, you yeah. can ask the town for $200,000 more, and that would make it 340. Yeah. But if you don't want to raise an appropriate, you either have to cut the budget mm -hmm. yeah. or cut revenues or do some, like you could do more with, with you could take 100,000 out of the fund, out of the tax rate stabilization fund. I guess my only argument is that there's, you know, it's the second meeting. We have multiple opportunities to look at that and see sure. what we can do. It's just, it's yeah, I guess the challenge of putting it into just, you know, the general revenue is is a one time revenue. If we don't get it, you know, we really we reduced our fund balance um, and we'll be out an yes. additional six hundred forty one thousand dollars of and so what that would just inflate the tax rate, right? So we're we're using this in some ways to decrease we're using the one time revenue to decrease the tax rate, which is but in the future year if we don't get it we're gonna increase it. Um, other than another option would be to put it Again, the special ed trust fund, um, where you can pull it in. And that's an option, but then you then you have to raise. Then raise you're it. losing the six hundred forty right in revenue. So I, I, I get the dilemma. Um, but at least the one this is combining with a one fifty reset. So if you did have more than you know that number, you you probably won't be lower than one fifty. I mean, the financial that'll happen in a little bit. But is I mean, like, like in another so, year, I mean, in another year, that 150. You know what I mean? There's but I hope that things don't keep happening like it seems to be happening, which is unknowns happen beyond our control that we didn't budget for. So, some districts would get six million dollars, even though, it's, and this is, and some districts are. I know it's one time, but we have to do even one year of three more teachers would help us for one year. So some would take in the six million and re increasing their expenses by five hundred thousand dollars and lowering their tax rate by five point five million, even though the memo said from the state this is one time because their class size and their educational program has been hurt for so long. I appreciate you explaining that to me. We are I'm not raising an expense side. We are just trying to control the revenue side. Like we didn't come and say I want a curriculum director and offset that by a six hundred fifty thousand dollar one time revenue. That carries on multiple budgets. Yeah. That goes on. Yep. That is not a recommendation. Does that help? Sure I understand it all. I hope that helps. Um, any other yeah. questions for Steve right now on the revenue side? And then I would. I just wanted to talk about swing over to class side a little bit. That's okay. Do you guys have any more questions on the worksheets? Because Jim, I know I'm trying to let you no, I get all your that. questions answered. I think I got my okay. questions, and I can. So I guess my only comment is we are increasing our expense side, right? So just yes. to your last point, it's not we don't have a flat. This isn't a flat budget. We're increasing no. our expense by right. And I, I didn't so. mean to misspeak. We didn't do it just yeah. because we had increased revenue. That, that's I, correct. I, I apologize. Apologize. No, no, no. It's okay. I just want to make sure, like I understand, I'm kind of thinking through at the same time. No, you're absolutely correct. I just yeah. wanted to say we didn't increase a specific position to offset that. Right? That's right. So when we got the security grant, the three hundred thousand dollars security grant, we incorporated that three hundred thousand dollars in revenue, but we also added three hundred thousand dollars on the expense side because right. we increased it for that one period of time to use that security money for yeah. that specific thing. Yeah. But it all has to be wrapped up into the big picture of the revenues and the expenses. Well, good, Jim. I'm, I'm giving no. you the chance to finish up your questions. Take your time. No, no, I'm, I'm good. I guess I'm, I'm just um, my uh, sophisticated response to the budget right now is we're in quite a pickle, um, <laughs> <laughs> and you know we have a dollar forty-five before we have our you know, contracts is um, is, a, is just extremely challenging. So I guess that's where I'm. That's going to segue into my question and comment. How's Perfect. that sound? I love it. How's that sound? Anybody else have any questions for Steve on the worksheets? Um, so, and I just wanted to swing over to the class size. Um, and Steve, very much appreciate putting this worksheet together. We've had a lot of conversations around class size, um, you know, even over the last um, year or so about where we are and where we are, um, you know, so where we are trending um, and recognizing that um, a significant amount of our um, budget is allocated to. Um, 
to uh, personnel. Um, one of the things I wanted to get um, input from the board and to um, potentially um, ask Steve and charge him with is the idea of looking at um, what the impact would be um, on class size and program if we were to ask him to essentially look at um, decreasing a position at Harold Martin, a position at Maple Street, position or positions at the, Maple, at the middle and high school, and a position within the, the special education area of our personnel and what that would look like in terms of sketching that out and um, from the perspective of class size program what would be under you know what would basically be in within that boundary of discussion um, and uh, a sort you know the associated sort of cost savings that would be with that um, and use that as a point or a jumping off point for discussion about the budget um, you know I think we're headed in a direction where um, you know, cutting reams of paper and boxes of pencils um, is not going to save ourselves from, you know, a, a situation that we recognize has been coming for quite a while and now we need to sort of look at, you know, different ways in which to, um, in, to address it. So, um, but I really would like the board's, you know, sort of input and support on asking Steve to do that, you know, as a, as a group as opposed to just me asking Steve to do that and have him bring that back next week um, to present to the board um, and what that would look like and with his leadership team essentially be able to say this is what that would look like. I think it's important for the community to hear um, what that would look like um, and I think it's important for the board to be able to have that consideration before we move forward on you know making any other recommendations um, but again I want the board's support on that um, to give Steve that charge for next week. I sure. Think be really helpful. I think so or if you have any additional comments on that or additional ideas or additional well, the, the only other comment is um, we don't have the sheet in front of us, but you know the, the population is going up. I know, I know we're tasking you with this, but just understanding that you're, we're tasking you with reducing staff as our population numbers are going up. Right, and that would be part of the understanding. You're absolutely yeah. right, Bill, and that'd be part of the understanding. Like what we know here is what we know. Right. The trends that we've seen and the the projections that we've looked at. Um, are things that we use to help form our decisions and inform our decisions around certain things. And I think that would be part of the conversation we would have once we see what that would look like and what it would do to our current class size, as well as what the projections, what that would look like from a projection perspective, if things were to become a reality. And our population would down this year overall, correct? It, well, it's, it, some, by like 2016. And, right, and like our, all our three school, everybody at the middle school, Every, every school except the middle school is bigger than they were last year. Yeah, but it's the middle school is slim. So, would you? Uh, um, we, we, we will have. We will, won't have, but we will take this on. Um, would you like to use the Nasdaq projected numbers, current numbers forward? Um, well, how can we? How can we best give you the best information possible? I, I mean, I would like to see, again, it's just me speaking, you guys can jump in and share, but I would like to see if we were to remain static, what that would look like, but also be able to refer to those projections knowing that, and we may have to do some delta work. Are you doing both? Some delta work, right, as far as, you know, the biggest, by building even, not, not, by, not by grade, but by building those projections. If we have a 10% projected increase at Maple Street next year, or for the following year, um, you know, we can we can see how that would impact class size, and I think at the high school it's really more of a conversation around program, um, which may lead into the programmatic budget conversation as well. So, um, again, it's really looking at what that type of impact would have overall across the district, but also within our various populations of within our district. Because one of the things, for example, I, I took a look at fifth grade or fourth grade. Fourth and fourth grade is bigger than it was up five kids, I think, since October 1. So why don't I use current, um, whatever we have current, move them over. Mm -hmm. And so if we, what would it be? And then uh, I'll also do another cell for projecting. That'd be great. But I'm not going to use, just to be clear, we're not going to use October 1 because October 1 is now old. We're going to use current, even if the class went down five, and I don't know that. 
I just happen to snapshot. In fifth time. grade is one that I look at with. Uh, sorry, fourth grade into fifth grade is one I look at often. Kindergarten I look at. Um, so we'll do that. That'd be great. That sounds good. So current and what would happen? Uh, one teacher at Harold, one teacher at Maple, two teachers at the middle high. You know, sixth grades and a, and a special ed. Those five staff and what it look like for class size. Is it two by five? Yeah, that would be very helpful, I think, one for special rest of all to look at. So you want, so you want one in middle high school or two in middle high school? Two. Two. Oh, okay. okay. Two. Two special ed and two right No, one no, special ed district wide. District wide. Oh. Special ed district wide. Okay. And one. And then one in the other two buildings. One in the other two, two, two between high school. high school, middle and high. Yeah. And whether it's one in middle and one in high, it's configured. I mean, it's all right. considered one yep. entity, if you will. So. And, we can, and, and Chris, we can do it. What looks. It, we can do it one at a time. This would be if we lost one, and then this would be if we lost two. So we can run two scenarios. You know what I mean? You want, you want me to do it two scenarios? So, so we'll, we'll talk about this at leadership. But yeah. So, so if we you. lost one, yep. no, one no, this no, is what we're meeting be. tomorrow to and do that. So. Okay. Thank you. I'm no, glad I appreciate that. That'd be very so helpful. I think it's for us to for me to look at. And I just want to be super clear. So between now and that's our time, we'll be there discussing that as a group, and so there won't be a tear. That will be our that will be our work, and we'll see what happens. But there's also under, yeah. There's cool. also understanding too that um, as you go up in grade, the class size becomes less of a. I mean, it, it becomes it becomes less less important. It, it's very important to have the lower class sizes at the lower grades, right? I mean, I, I get you're showing us what it would all mean, but. Those are the classes that are increasing in size, just as long as everybody understands. And I guess we'll talk about there are a lot of nuances. And the, the struggle is it's the, just, a, it's just a snapshot, right? Just right. Yeah. And the struggle for Chris and Greg right, is very, very difficult to predict. Right. right. Like once, once you get to nine through twelve, it's very difficult to predict. Right. Because it's based on motivational theory, not just advancement and change. Yeah. And that's the struggle. Well, and, yeah. and student choice. So yeah, so I mean, it becomes that, much more programmatic, right? And, yeah. and the number of students who want to take AP courses, or the number of students involved with the performing arts and visual arts, I mean, we also try to meet those interests as well as much as we can. Um, so we're really careful about where we place some classes, and um, it's not as easy as people think. Um, it's a lot of massaging. It's a lot of sometimes hand schedule, what we call hand scheduling, mm -hmm. to make things work. Um, and that's why it's, it's hard, because we, we, we can push one button in the scheduler to change one student's schedule, and that could actually have an effect on six other different schedules. Sure. You know, so, it's just, it's. So, so as you, as again, and I'll let this one go, because I know we're just looking at stuff, but as, as we begin to, as, as the um, staff begins to talk about redu reduction of a personnel, maybe some feedback on you know how that would impact them, it, just in yeah. the same way yeah. you talked. Like yeah. what, what are the nuances of that? Absolutely. Right. That's, the all and that's yeah. what I'm asking Steve okay. to do, is let it to, to let narrate it. Yes. what that would look like. Right. What it would look impact. like on paper, and then what it would mm -hmm. actually mean Correct. in practice. Absolutely. And just remember, minimum standards. Like we cannot right. eliminate family and consumer science. It is required by state law. That's the thing that people, we, I'm not that I would. I love you, Carol. I'm not talking about that. Um, but you know, so we cannot just, uh, we've been you know, by approved high school, you have to have certain things in high school. Some things you don't have to have. Like, but you know, so it's not, so we have, in science, 24 kids. You can't put more than 24 in a class. So all that goes into this, but it's an exercise that this helps the board understand the community we're all in. Um, but it is, it, you know, it's a very difficult thing to do. But I understand it, and I got the direction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Guys. Steve, all right, Jim. Thank you. I hope we got. No, I hope we got all your questions in on time. Yes. So I think we did the update. We did the discussion long term. Tiers we're doing to a, a little bit different this year, so that's Thanks, fine. I went through the warrant budget committee schedule. It's on the agenda. It's also in board notes. Uh, January 8th is our first pre presentation, 5.30, the Hopkins Town Hall. January 15th is our second. January 22nd is a third, if necessary. And February... 
February 12th is the public hearing at the high school. And that's at 6 o'clock, I think. Perfect. So that's about it. Everybody's got that? Got that's on Wednesday. Are we okay? Mm -hmm. um, so in the packet, in, I don't know if anybody's, and I can, I don't know if I'm going to project it. So we have a, a, an example of a uh, uh, first draft of the calendar. Um, so I talked about the calendar about a, a couple weeks ago. So a couple of nuances in this calendar. Um, the anomaly is Labor Day, September 7th. So one of the controversies that you have, or controversies, one of the interests that people had, do you start before Labor Day or after Labor Day? Well, starting after Labor Day would move us almost into July. So this year, that's not there. But um, so right now, what is it? Want me to project it? I can do that. I've got mad skills. <laughs> Seven, right? Seven. So here's the calendar. Uh, first day for teachers, uh, new staff would be the 24th. Uh, full staff, 25, 26, 27. The 28th is off. Kids, first day back is the 31st. That aligns with the regional technical center. That's a common start date for kids in the region, which we think is a good thing. September 4th is the Friday before Labor Day, that's fair parking. The 7th, no school, that's September. October 12th is Indigenous People Day. Oh, 9th, it didn't show up very well. 9th is a PD day. So there'd be a, a, the kids would have a four day weekend. In the past when we did that, people liked that, especially if you're looking at colleges for the last time. A four day weekend in October helps kids decide on their colleges. Um, November, um, that's our parent, that's uh, a, a parent-teacher conference, and uh, as typically we have major elections off. So the third is election day, so that would be a parent-teacher conference day. It would not be a student day. Um, for national election, um, parking, and just keeping kids away from, you never know, frivolity that happens with elections. So uh, we think that's a good thing. Uh, uh, Veterans Day is the 11th. Uh, yes, Yes, and then you have the Thanksgiving break, 25, 26, 27. December holiday break, you have two days, then you go for away for eight. Um, 18th is the day is of Martin Luther King, and the 29th is the day between semesters for high school. 22 to 26 is February break. 25 to 29 is April break. PD day around a four day weekend. And then this is the struggle because I, for the last few years, we've really tried hard for the third Monday in June to be the last day. This breaks that cycle because Labor Day is so late that our last day, no later than with five snow days, would be the 24th, which is yucky. But we don't have any, we don't have any choices. That's what it is. So that's your calendar. By contract, it has to be approved at the next board meeting, which would be the 19th. So this, uh, everybody okay? Steve, you, you said this before, but uh, tell me the parties that were involved putting this schedule together. And, 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 uh, this is the Professional Learning Committee, and Mr. Goopel, yep. Ms. Forrestall are on that committee. Yep. Okay. Ms. Gagin, and some teachers, and they get together and they look at, because professional learning connects deeply to the calendar. And we did get a lot of feedback, and Steve had sent out some surveys about not only the professional learning, the way that we had done it this year, also about like when would people, do people prefer to start with the whole Labor Day piece, and that a lot of the challenge too is the sports, and like no matter when you start, if you have kids that are in athletics that are starting and they're back way before school starts. So there was a lot of pieces in there, but that was all driven by feedback from different stakeholder groups. And we also tried to mimic, mimic Concord because we have students that go to Concord, so we compared calendars too. So. It's always I always admire Chris and their schedule isn't just a middle high school schedule, <laughs> a high school schedule. It's also a Concord regional schedule. It's, it's a really fun schedule. Uh, everybody okay? So this is just feedback tonight, but it will be an action item next week. 
We'll have one more. Um, Donna will look at it again. The leadership team will look at it again. Make sure we count every day. Make sure we have, and some people don't know, we have 177 school days in the Hopkins School District, not the traditional 180. We, went, we have 177 full days. We used to have 180 days with six half days. And the community and the teachers and the students, so I don't know about the students, but most like uh, full days. Everybody okay? Great. Yeah, a lot of folders. Um, talk a little bit about policy. Keep rolling. Mm -hmm. So coming to the board tonight for action items are four policies for third reading. Um, the first one is non-discrimination. That follows the recommended uh, addition from the School Boards Association. It increases our, make sure we have aligned with the state law so we're in good shape. Same thing, ADB, Substance Free Workplace, this aligns with legislation. Uh, it, it meets our needs. Um, so data records and retention, thank you to Ms. Forrest. So Becky, thank you for your piece. She reviewed the policy and recommends simply we change the language from parents and guardians to parents and guardians and adult students. Uh, it is, uh, so I don't, that, that is much more accurate. It's not a substantive change, it really is a classification change. So tonight, if the board is happy, they can say as presented and those changes will be made and they will go up on the web. And the last one is IHCA summer activities and this would complete our required policies. Um, everybody okay? Mm -hmm. So we're gonna make the change of parent, guardian, and adult students. Oh, thank you. The next one, you know, I'm gonna do a little bit about where we are. So about you know, a month ago, there was a charge and the policy committee wanted to review our safety-related policies. And in full transparency, we hadn't looked at JICI, weapons on school grounds, since I've been superintendent. I've been superintendent for 11 years. So we did look at it, and, and the way that typically we develop policy is there's three or four school districts that have resources in significant uh, uh, planning around policy, so we try to reach out to those school districts and use those as templates, as well as the school boards association. So a, a couple years ago, related to uh, voting, if you remember, we had the National Honor Society struggle with uh, doing um, some work at voting for babysitting due to this notion about guns and, and or weapons on school property. And what happened was when Governor, Sin before Governor Sununu um, was elected, the New Hampshire had a permit required with the permit aligned with the Federal Safe Schools Act. You could only be on campus if you had a permit and that aligned, if you didn't have a permit, you, didn't, you um, weren't on campus. Uh, Governor Sununu changed the permitting requirements. He no longer required it, so it was a little bit different. So our state law didn't align, align with the Safe Schools Act. Um, and we spent a lot of time figuring out, can we make a statement about weapons on our schools? Um, a number of school districts, Oyster River, Mascoma, Milford, and Hanover, had made statements about, what they, about policy about um, weapons on school grounds. One of the things, and I, I did meet with Chief McCord, gave him a copy of this policy and sat with him knee to knee for a while. And the, one of the distinction that is, is important is voting. Because obviously someone's right to vote is significant, impinging on anybody's right to vote is serious. So we cannot, by order of the Attorney General, we could not save someone if they were carrying a weapon into our voting, into a school and voting, we could not prevent them from voting. They are not in violation of the law. So what Chief is recommending that we can, by policy, say during school activities that uh, we can say by policy weapons are not allowed on campus and we refer them to the police. So say for example, Chris is at a basketball game and this actually happened. When I was a varsity basketball coach, there was a gym in New Hampshire that uh, someone came and brought a gun to while well, I was a varsity basketball coach. So say that happens. So someone from another town came and always carries a weapon, wants to go to a school. Chris is at the game because he goes to a few basketball games in his little life, sees it, and he would go up and say, I'm sorry, excuse me, sir, by policy, you are not allowed to be on campus with that weapon. And it's by policy, I have to contact the police. And that's what he would do. And the police would come, and the police would escort that person out. Not violate the law, not arrest, but by policy not be on campus. 
And the reason why is because as a policy, we believe that um, students and faculty, spectators feel more safe not having weapons in school. So that, the chief supports that um, and would, would implement that. So that cha those changes are different than you saw for the first reading. Those will be second reading changes. The other piece, we've talked about it as a leadership team. There, I put in language in the next iteration you'll see on, on the second reading about using knives in, during the workday. Um, there are times when our, fa our faculty need to use a part of their job, splitting wires, doing, using knives, and sometimes kids under the supervision, for example, in woodshop or in engineering or electricity. So under the supervision of an adult in school, knives, or work knives, workplace knives would be appropriate. So we added a, a workplace exception for knives and during school activities regarding all other weapons. And we think this is a good statement to make and support the, the school. Everybody okay? Norm, did I do all right in covering that? Yeah, you did, you did great. Um, I just back one question. You coordinated with Matt and her on the, the data records of retention? I did. Okay. Uh, Matt would like you guys it. thumbs up on it? Matt was in favor. Sorry, I should have mentioned that. I, yes. I didn't yeah. give him top billing. Yeah. I should have given you some top billing. I would have spoken up. <laughs> yes, I okay. both connected and both signed up. Thank you. And I, yeah, I apologize. For no, that. no, I'll just make sure I'm Don't the eye on that. Perfect. Thank you, guys. So think about this one. You're going to see second reading with the changes about workplace and about during school activity. It's not an action item tonight. You'll see second reading. Everybody okay? Yep. Yep. A um, couple of quick personnel. Um, Mo McAuliffe, a former Nordic skier at Hopkinton High School, now is coming back to coach. She's going to coach middle schoolers for us. Um, so she's a nominee. And uh, Peggy Di Pastina, who used to work with us as an instructional assistant, she's going to be our kitchen manager at Maple Street oh, School. Awesome. Everybody okay with those? Yeah. Um, the financials, and we really did, but the key, the key piece of the financial is about the unreserved fund balance and where it's at. It's significantly better than it was. It was 40, right, something like that, Michelle. Um, there's been some personnel changes regarding retirements and regarding all, you know, and stuff. So um, we think that's where it's at. And um, certainly there is a lot of people, I don't know if they're watching this, but a lot of people would like to, are encouraging and doing, asking me to do everything I can to deploy some of the funds. Uh, for example, we haven't bought library books. We haven't bought reading books. Um, to deploy some of these funds um, so we can implement FY20 budget. And we can still do that and have the fund, the, where the fund, uh, unreserved fund balance is right now. Everybody okay? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Questions from Michelle on the financial? Thank you, Michelle. You've got a lot on your plate right now. <laughs> uh, three yeah, donations. <clears throat> One of my she most does. fun donations I haven't received, received in a long time. Telepresent robots. Uh, we've got three of them from uh, Crotchy Mountain, and uh, Matt and his crew, and maybe some kids will uh, try and play with those and see what we can do with those. And those are total value of $1,500. Can someone explain oh, like a bee yeah. Is it like a bee gout? It's essentially, it almost looks like a segue with a holder for an iPad, and the idea is you can have an app that you can remotely control it and drive it around. We've used it a lot in the past for kids with um, medical issues mm -hmm. who are unable to attend school for certain reasons, but are still able to be part of their classes and be nice. with their classmates, things like that. Excellent. Awesome. Cool. So far, we've only used it with um, engineering students exploring the mm -hmm. <laughs> It has but good potential. Fairness, we only got the front. has so great potential. Yes. You asked for you asked for them? How did we get uh, A community member volunteered them to us. Huh? And full credit, uh, Matt has uh, a lot of skills in a lot of areas, and another school reached out to Matt for some help. And while they was here, Matt was gracious and gave a lot of his time in, in this world. And while they're there, what? Would you like these? And Matt doesn't say no too often to toys. Well, and what Matt doesn't, we had been looking actually for one previously a couple of months ago, and no one had any that we could loan to use, so it actually looks like it. Excellent. Uh, some emergency kits for Harold Martin School and some supplies at Harold Martin, just a couple of grades at Harold Martin School, too. Quick, um, the emergency kits are actually for both Maple and Harold. Um, yeah, high school's been there for many years, and our security uh, we've had emergency kits for a long time. I can't emergency hear. kits, you've had them. Oh, we have. Yeah. Backpacks, yeah. we've called them before. 
Um, we had a situation in Harold uh, last year at some point where it was a very cold day. Um, we had a fire alarm go off due to actually an oily rag in the washing machine. Um, but kids were outside for quite a while, and they, and they were starting to get cold. I was real quick, quickly going to evacuate them to um, across the street to uh, St. Andrews. Andrews. And uh, fortunately, we were okay. Fire department came and helped us. But it reminded us we really do need Nice. Things like blankets and so on. So Amy and I talked to our safety committees. Uh, we're putting some money in from our playground fund from our spaghetti dinner. And the PTA was amazingly uh, good about it too. So we worked together to make this happen. So we will change this on the fly because you're good at that mm -hmm. to MSS as well. Okay. And we have an overnight trip tonight. Final approval for San Juan, Puerto Rico. And I did check the State Department. Guess what? There is no warnings for American property. They just don't do it. But I did look. I wasn't sure. So there is no travel one. So we're good to go. Excellent. Great. Thank All right. you. Um, any other questions for Steve from the board before I open it up for public comment? All set. Um, at this point, um, we have the second opportunity for public comment. If anyone would like to come up to the microphone and share um, their comments with the board. Amanda Gilman. Um, really, I have some clarification questions. Um, so is the new, am I trying to understand correctly that the new budget is, from tonight, is 20 million 513, uh, it's on yes. this handout. Yes. yes. Okay, so this is obviously old from last night, uh, last, last week. week, and this says 21 million 755, the bottle of, bottom of 20, it up? which is a huge up? difference. Well, I don't have last, last, the only difference was I went down. Oh, I messed it up. So, so regardless, 20 to zero is correct, and I can disregard that. I want to make sure, unless Michelle says it's correct, I yield to Michelle. Well, 25, 13, 737 is just the general fund, but then when you add in all the other funds, which is part of our operating budget, gotcha. that's what brings us to 21, 731, which is what the operating budget would be. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that makes sense. Then uh, the 20 million, 513, is uh, an increase of 1.1 million. That's what this paper says, yes? Okay. Uh, so it might understand that the 640,000 is put into the general budget as revenue. 641,000 from the state is yes. ge general revenue. So in essence, is the budget up $1.8 million this year then? No, that's, no, the expense side is the expense. So, so simple, what, dirty math, though, right? You, you got what, 641, and you went up an additional. No, am I doing my math we wrong? We look at them independent of so, one another. Are you wondering what the total tax impact number is? No, no, like just how much you went up. So, so this 1.1 1. 1. for expense. For expense. Yeah, that's for expenses. Yeah. Yep. Okay. The revenue factors in on the tax setting. It's not, we it's didn't not increase by 1.7 and deduct it on the expense right. side. Right, gotcha. But you're okay. Just, you're just asking on the expense side. Yeah. Gotcha, I get right. it. So they're separate. Uh, so, and then there's 140 into maintenance, there's 40 into the special ed, yep. and 15 into vehicle, and yep. nothing for tax rate stabilization. But we're still- uh, like Nothing coming out. out. Nothing coming out, and nothing, but nothing going in. Well, when does the tax rate stabilization fund when does that get, we pulled 175 out previously this correct. year, correct? Yes. So when does money go into the tax rate stabilization fund? At, at the end of the and school year, if there's money left over, the board votes to put it in. Correct. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, good questions, Amanda, thank you. All right, we will move on to action items for uh, tonight. I'll take a motion for the Hopkins School Board to accept the superintendent's recommendation to adopt policy AC non-discrimination. So moved. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Take a motion for the Hopkins School Board to accept the superintendent's recommendation to adopt policy ADP substance free workplace. So moved. Seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Take a motion for the Hopkins School Board to accept the superintendent's recommendation to adopt policy EHB data records and retention. So moved. Seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. 
Take a motion for the Hopkins School Board to accept the superintendent's recommendation to adopt policy IHCA summer activities. So moved. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Take a motion for the Hopkins School Board to approve the superintendent's nomination of Maureen McAuliffe Middle School Nordic coach for the 2019-20 school year. So moved. Seconded. Thanks, Dan. Any further discussion? And thank you, Maureen, for stepping up and, and doing that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Take a motion for the Hopkins School Board to approve the superintendent's nomination of Peggy DePestina, Maple Street School Kitchen, kitchen Maple Street School Kitchen Manager, pending final approval of the superintendent of schools. So moved. Seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Take a motion for the Hopkins School Board to approve the superintendent's recommendation to accept a donation of three telepresent robots with an approximate value of fifteen hundred dollars from the Crotchet Mountain School. So moved. Seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Take a motion for the Hopkins School Board to approve the superintendent's recommendation to accept a donation in the amount of nine hundred and forty-four dollars and seventy-seven cents from the Hopkins PTA in support of Harold Martin School and Maple Street School emergency kits. So moved in. Thank you, PTA. Um, do you want to add that? What? It just says Harold Martin. Did I you? did. Oh, you weren't listening. Sorry. <laughs> I was reading. I wasn't listening. Second. <laughs> Right. It's a hard one to Any further discussion? Say, are we in agreement my, my here? Are we in right agreement? You were, you were double checking on me. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Yes, yes. Take a motion for the Hopkins School Board to approve the superintendent's recommendation to accept two anonymous donations in the amount of $500 each in support of Harold Martin School first and third grade teacher supplies. So moved. Second. That's great. Any further discussion? And thank you to the PTA for their donations. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Any opposed? Motion carries. Take a motion for the Hopkins School Board to approve the superintendent's recommendation to grant final approval for the Hopkins High School Interact Club overnight trip to Puerto Rico, February 2020. So moved. Seconded. Any further discussion? Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Do we have a need for a non-public session? I don't unless you do. Do not. Cool. <laughs> <Really? Sweet. laughs> no non-public. I will adjourn I the meeting at 6.56 then. Nice. I don't have to do notes. You're welcome. Thank you for your